Okay, well, thank you very much for being here this early in the morning, and it's a pleasure to be here again. Uh, so what I'm going to talk about is project evaluation and uncertainty. This is a subject that um, has been around for a while, uh, mostly within the business community. But for the last few years, actually, there has been a lot of interest uh, on the mathematical aspects of such uh, topics. So, brief outline of my talk, I'm going to give some background. I'm going to discuss what we call the hedged Monte Carlo algorithm, uh, some examples, some conclusions, and then what I'd like to do is perhaps uh, take the opportunity that I'm here with um, to discuss uh, some uh, work with Emmanuel Gobet uh, that uh, is called the non-intrusive stratified resampling method. So this is a method that uh, together with him and with uh, his student, Yang Liu, we have developed. And it turned out to be pretty much motivated by this uh, subject that we um, started in these uh, studies of the hedge Monte Carlo method. Uh, so this, is, uh, this started with a, a project we had a few years ago with the Brazilian oil company called Petrobras. And uh, so basically they asked us about the possibility of evaluating projects uh, using real option techniques from data that was observed in the uh, market and that passed through some kind of uh, computational treatment that they had so that they could project the costs and their uh, future gains. So the idea is that they have some big, big system that does uh, some kind of optimization according to the information they have, and they do some planning on that, and they then run simulations based on these uh, possible scenarios, and uh, then they get the possible uh, gains. So I'm going to be more precise on that a little bit later. Uh, so, but back to the main question of the Subject, the question is in real options, how to evaluate projects and their optionalities under uncertainty in a consistent way with market fluctuations. And what I mean by market fluctuations is many times you, want, you are in a business, in a company, and you are trying to, uh, for one side, decide about some investments of your company. On the other side, you have a trading desk that has to uh, make investments, has to uh, perhaps sell or buy calls, puts, and uh, forwards and contracts like that. And uh, oftentimes, uh, such investments are so big that uh, they have uh, to ta be taken into account when you evaluate your project. So you have some kind of hedging, and uh, you have also the uh, general aspects of your investment. So for example, uh, this is for example building a real estate development and how you kind of hedge that towards uh, with, with uh, instruments from the market. So this is more or less the general question. So let me give you a brief uh, outline of this field that's called real options. This is paradise for people who study BSDEs, stochastic control, dynamic programming. That means you, Stefan. <laughs> OK. Uh, so in real options, we are interested in assigning monetary values to strategic decisions, such as create a firm, invest in a new project, start a real estate development, finance some kind of research and development project, temporarily suspend operations, and some people go even further, starting a PhD program, getting married or something like that. But I didn't ask that in my possible serious applications. 
So uh, usually there are complex claims, uh, barrier clauses, exotic character of such uh, optionalities. Uh, there are also cash flows in decision trees, optimal exercise times, and a mix of historical and risk neutral measures. So this is the kind of main issue here, actually, that was behind our discussions. So how to, in a simple way, balance this um, historical information, historical data, with the risk neutral measure. Uh, a little bit of background on the field. Um, well, everybody knows the original paper of Black Scholes. In fact, in the Black Scholes paper, read, there is a mention about warranties. If you look carefully, there is kind of thinking a little bit on this real option uh, uh, direction. Uh, there is a famous paper by Myers from 77. Uh, there was a Brazilian guy at Berkeley doing his PhD thesis that worked on this uh, value of uh, natural resources. McDonald and Siegel wrote a very influential paper and the, the field bloomed. So there are lots of things actually. This is a very, very broad field. And there is a famous book by Pindic. So in its most basic and kind of, uh, let's say, simple form, and, and being simple, it's open to many criticisms. The idea that people had in this real option uh, technology or methodology is consider that there is a spanning asset. So what's a spanning asset? A spanning asset is basically something that's highly correlated to your project could be even the actual value of the project. And uh, this is something that's going to undergo some kind of stochastic process. And uh, somehow the project value would be uh, computed by taking some soup. Or actually, this is the optionality of entering the project, I, I should say. So V is the value of this spanning asset. You would enter the project with an investment I and uh, we have a discounting factor, and you decide whether to enter or not the project. If this immediate value of entering the project is uh, greater than or equal to the optionality of uh, waiting for the, uh, the, the, the option and not exercising it. So this is a typical American option type of thing and uh, you are then computing the essential soup over the stopping times, given that at time t, the value of your project is v. Uh, and you can put all kinds of models for uh, your v. So then, uh, in this context that I'm writing here, what you have is that p, uh, as a function of time, and the value at time t satisfies a Black-Scholes model with free boundary conditions. But of course, this is extremely, extremely simple. It's extremely, uh, perhaps, unrealistic yet. On the other hand, people get a good mileage from this. They really uh, tend to use it a lot in the industry. So what we want to do is actually go further, go beyond that, and try to develop technologies or methodologies that would uh, not necessarily undergo the good old Black Scholes model, and perhaps have much more complex uh, payoffs and complex uh, optionalities. But just to give you an idea, since this is uh, supposed to be kind of a, a general seminar, uh, the connection, there is a kind of dictionary between the world of, uh, let's say, financial investments and the world of real options. And uh, the dictionary is basically that the underlying price is substituted by the project's present value. The variance of the stock is usually taken to be the variance of the return value. The exercise price is usually the development cost. The expiration date is the time limit for the investment. The risk-free rate is usually the risk-free rate for the investment, which may not be the risk-free rate of the market. 
The dividend rate is the risk-adjusted return rate of the project. So those are kind of equivalents that became very common in the field. So there is a lot of uh, literature on that, and there are congresses, there are uh, lots of people that are interested in this. And when you discuss with, for example, many companies such as oil companies and uh, with uh, um, medical companies that do research and development, they actually have a very good grasp of this uh, terminology here, and they want things in this terminology. Okay, uh, well, so far so good, but things are oversimplified there. Uh, usually, many investments, uh, these companies uh, think of infinite time horizon, which is not really the case. Uh, this perfect correlation between the so-called spending asset, complete market, perfect hedging is totally uh, unrealistic. And uh, it doesn't take into account competition. So there's a very nice paper, very, uh, let's say, uh, provoking, thought-provoking paper by uh, Walter Schachmeyer and Hubalek. Uh, the limitations of no arbitrage arguments for real options, and there they really touch deeply into the, um, let's say, the uh, problem. They really pin down the fact that when you don't have a complete market, and the computation that we do by all this beautiful technology of uh, uh, financial options may fail badly, well, still, you want to do something. You want to get a number, you want to get decisions, and uh, so we, we are kind of motivated, in fact, by looking at this paper and trying to at least give some kind of reasonable answer. So back to the motivation that I was talking about. Uh, in this problem we had with uh, Petrobras, uh, we basically have a set of traded assets, uh, Xi, uh, I from 1 to N, perhaps the oil price of the gasoline price, the, well, you name it. And there are non-traded assets, things like production curves and things like that, that are also going to go into some big machinery, which is what we call an oracle for the cash flow generation. And uh, so basically what they would tell us is the following. If we have such and such curves of inputs, then we get that. And then they would give us this raw data, and you know, now you guys take care of it. You're mathematicians, you should be able to do it. Well, not really. Uh, so, but the problem then is how to make sense of this. And what I'm going to discuss now is a methodology, but uh, um, in order to discuss this methodology, what we have to do is actually go back and uh, understand really what is, uh, what's causing, let's say, possible gains and how these things really work. So look at the beast at its teeth. Uh, so cash flows and project values are usually highly dependent, at least in this uh, energy industry, with commodity price. So these things are uh, very correlated. It's, as I said, possible and actually very likely the company is going to uh, do financial hedging, especially when it has to deal with several currencies. <clears throat> uh, it's often uh, the, the, the profit in the cash flows come from margins. So, for example, for, from buying brand and selling uh, different products, so there's a margin between the brand and the gasoline price and so on and so forth kerosene or whatever. Uh, usually for evaluating these projects, this oracle that I just mentioned, which is this big system, uh, is adjusted to run with and without a project. So the typical question they would ask us is, is it worth or not to start a refinery? Is it worth or not to uh, expand on a refinery? Okay. Uh, and what they would pro produce is then a set of simulations with the actual values with the refinery and without the refinery. And the difference of such cash flows then would be uh, basically the output. So they would give 
as perhaps the difference only, or perhaps both the actual refinery and uh, with and without the refinery prices. Uh, the evaluations of the cash flow come from that come from this oracle are usually very time consuming. So they have usually to put a big computer working for several days to produce such simulations. And the reason for that is because usually the cash flows are based on optimizing the full network of the company. So for example, if you start a refinery in one place, then you need to decide how you're going to carry things out of that refinery. And that, on the other hand, brings in an, a bunch of different optimization problems. And so these things are time consuming. So we have to use as little information as possible. And of course, in any investment, there are windows of opportunity. You know, sometimes you miss the opportunity and that's it. Uh, as I said, there are complex optionality. So all those issues, all those, all those motivations are the ones that are motivating our, our questions here and our approach. So we, what I'm going to discuss now is perhaps a methodology, which is just a, a proposal. And uh, it's uh, something that we uh, proposed uh, as a way of uh, uh, evaluating such optionalities in a simple but not too simple way. Uh, this appeared in this uh, special volume of the Commodities, Energy, and Environmental Science at the Fields Institute uh, back in 2015. Looks like yesterday, but time flies. Uh, the, challenge, as I, the challenges, as I said, is most of the simulations come from historical measures. We have managerial views that need to be incorporated. There is marketing completeness, unhedgeable risks, multiple assets. So the problem is not really simple. Uh, there are lots of uh, people who have worked on this. Uh, there's a classical method, there are Monte Carlo-based approach. Uh, my friend Jaime Mungau and Loshery, my friends Jaime Mungau and Loshery came up with an interesting method as well. So there are different approaches, but I don't have really time to go into that. Uh, there are the references in the paper, and uh, it's very interesting. So, here's the approach. So, in the approach, what we do is, and I'm going to put some notation on the board, given that I find chop, yes? Okay. Yeah. So, we have these driving assets, which we call XT. Uh, and I keep it on the board because I'll need it for further reference. We have some kind of, so this in principles for each T belongs to some RN. Might be Brent, uh, gas, uh, kerosene, and so on and so forth. We have a hedging portfolio, which is uh, Phi T. Uh, this in principle can be bought or sold, so it's something that belongs to RB as well. And we have this thing that we call VT, which is the price of the option or derivative, okay? And so this is hedging, and this is, let's say, basic asset prices. Okay. And Please feel free to interrupt me. I'm missing my teaching duty, so. Okay, so, oh, I'm sorry. Let me, uh, yes? Uh, how close or different is that from uh, the paper by Schumacher that you mentioned? Uh, in the paper, uh, what they do is actually. So they, I, I was asking how close or different is that from mm -hmm. the paper by Schumacher that George mm -hmm. mentioned in the beginning? Yeah, yeah. So, so in the paper that they do, what they do is basically do a, f a very simple example of uh, evaluating a, a real option in the situation of an incomplete market. Now, in the incomplete market, then you have a whole uh, interval of possible measures of risk or, or risk premium. And they show that the value of this real option might be very, very, uh, the, var the, the variation of this price might be very big. So they, they basically do an example and they explain why the example is so contundent and so serious. 
they don't really discuss any methodology or so. They just take the general method of uh, you know, standard textbook, like for example, one of those references that I made, and say, okay, suppose now the market happens to be incomplete, then things are tough, okay? So, now let me explain to you the idea which motivated uh, this paper of ours and this approach, which actually we implemented. Uh, the idea is the following. If I'm at time t, okay, let me find my chalk again. So, if I happen to be at time t, and I go to time t plus delta t in a discrete way, uh, I can uh, look at the variation of my project, of my price, as given by this v of t plus delta t minus v of t with the discount of the uh, risk rate, the interest-free uh, rate. Uh, I can also do some hedging, and uh, the hedging is basically taking the amount of hedged value times the price in a product here. And when you go from t to t plus delta t, uh, I'm assuming that this thing varies like that. And uh, of course, the hedge is something that you keep at, until t plus delta t minus. And uh, so you have that variation, and we can then compute the, um, the discount of all that. And this whole quantity, then, I can think of taking an average, and uh, I'm sure you have seen this in many shapes and forms, and perhaps this is one way of putting it that's too complicated. But anyway, what I'm basically saying is that the variance from this uh, t to t plus delta t is really what you want to minimize. Now, you might also, instead of taking this average, which is here, uh, is here denoted by these brackets, you might consider some risk measure. You can do more complicated things. But uh, somehow, the risk is uh, usually taken as a function of the variance. You can also look at it as a one-sided variance, and there are all these variations on the theme that you can take. But let's, for simplicity, consider that. If you consider it like that way, what basically you have is a, a basic recursion where you come back from t plus delta t to t, and you want to minimize your risk from here to here. Okay, and what's the control here? In this case, the control is nothing more than the hedging portfolio vector, and you want to compute the value of v. So you minimize over v and over v, given that you already know what happened in the future. Okay, standard dynamic programming. Okay, so then you can actually produce uh, an algorithm. Uh, you come backwards, you initialize the project value at time capital T uh, with your payoff, uh, given the investment. This investment also might be random, if you wish. Uh, and what I'm going to describe here is basically uh, the Longstaff Schwartz approach. Actually, I, I should stop here and uh, make some credits. Uh, we had this idea by looking at a very interesting paper by Potters, Bouchou, and Sestovic, called the hedged Monte Carlo approach. Now, what's the difference between the hedged Monte Carlo approach to, real, uh, to options in general and the usual approach? Is that in the hedged Monte Carlo approach, we don't use the risk-free or risk-neutral measure, sorry. Um, we use the historical measure, we do the computations with the historical measures, and somehow it's by introducing this fee that you get the, the risk-free. The fee here is, again, the hedging portfolio. So if we're in the situation of uh, the risk-neutral measure, the red part would not be here, and you do just general backward regression, and uh, you would be basically doing Mont um, some Monte Carlo method in the spirit of Longstaff-Schwartz. 
Here what we are doing is we introducing that control and we are minimizing both on phi and on v. Uh, I, uh, I'm going to describe now the algorithm. Usually at this moment I actually connect this with the uh, Fulmer Schweitzer uh, approach. It's, a, it's very well understood and basically for those of you who know it and I have also the, the slides in the end, basically what we're getting here is the minimal martingale measure and uh, nothing more, nothing less than that if we are working with uh, the standard option setup. And there are lots of results about that, so I can discuss that at the end, but I decided to skip that part now and just give you the algorithm, which is actually the construction of the former Schweitzer uh, decomposition, but in a concrete way using a basis. So I'm kind of missing, mixing Fulmer Schweitzer with uh, Longstaff Schwartz. Okay, so uh, backwards, initialize the project at final time, uh, get the payoff, uh, which would be in this example just uh, the standard call because you want to decide whether you invest, let's say, uh, value k and you get out of that vt and you do that only if vt is greater than k, so that's the usual initialization of this thing. And you define some expansion of your uh, project value and the hedging portfolio, which for perversity now, I'm using the variable psi instead of phi. It's just my perversity, okay? And uh, so xi here, or xi is the value of the of the hedging, and now we solve a quadratic minimization problem. Rho here is the discount factor, and you expand these things in the right basis, you do the computation, you press the um, quadratic solver of your MATLAB, and, or your favorite Python perhaps, or something like that, and uh, you get this argmin. Uh, it's interesting that I'm minimizing here over the variable psi on a basis and gamma, which are the basis expansion of the value of phi. Now we check whether it's worthwhile or not to exercise if you are, have some kind of clause of uh, excess, possible exercise. If you don't, of course, you skip that. And you repeat that backwards all the way to get the price. And as a byproduct, you also get the exercise region. Of course, with that, you can have many, many variations. Alessandro might not be, ah, Alessandro, you are there. So Alessandro, you see that you can also do um, your weight uh, thing here. Just, uh, we didn't know about your work at that point, sorry. But uh, yeah, we have been around for too much time. So, so anyway, but at this point, I, I'd like actually to see, I never, okay, I learned about their work uh, recently, but, but um, it turns out that it would be nice also to, to see variations on that, okay? Uh, I, I must confess, the first time I read the paper by uh, uh, Hedge, on Hedge Monte Carlo, I didn't believe it. And they sat down and said, okay, either it's totally false or very simple, and it's going to give me good results. So I implemented it in MATLAB, and uh, what I'm showing you here is just the example from textbook that uh, convinced me, and it's really a good example for your classes. Take, for example, a standard MATLAB option, where you have to switch between two uh, different uh, assets. You get one asset in exchange for the other, and you have perhaps a strike. Uh, for those things, you have a very simple computing formula, you can, you know, basically reduce it to Black and Scholes, and you can actually compute it by the Hedge Monte Carlo, and uh, this is my uh, end of afternoon implementation of that. So basically in green here, what you have is the uh, actual Hedge Monte Carlo, and uh, I call BS but for Black and Scholes, uh, and the Black and Scholes meaning the Magrab option computed according to the Black Scholes formula. So you see the agreement is really fantastic, and I get the hedge almost 
perfect except of course on the edges here and if it's perfect don't believe it it's not so good to be true you know that so anyway um, so th this convinced me that this is actually a nice method worth really trying and we actually tried it for uh, lots of things. In fact, what's very nice too is suppose instead of having only two assets, you put like 10 other assets there and uh, you assume that it depends only on two of them, but you actually do the computation with, let's say, 10. And the results are not very different from that. And so anyway, this I think is what I'm showing here. Uh, so you get this kind of uh, uh, blurred thing because you're coming from 10 dimensions and projecting on two. So these are, uh, as I said, the Magrat option. Okay, now, uh, some real practical examples that came from data that we got. So the company wants to compute some optionality, let's say that would last for 11 years. Uh, the project value is dependent on 12 different underlines, so we are really in high dimensions here, we are not you know, in a low dimension situation. The option is exercisable every year for the first five years. So there is a window of opportunity. And it also has a trading desk that could be used for hedging and for investments on the financial world. So they might shut operations and just play in the stock market. And the optionality is evalu wise evaluated using several different sets of hedging assets. So we tried uh, different combinations. And these are real data, so they are provided. We actually don't see anything about the actual machine that's providing this data. And we actually use very few paths, like 2,000 paths. So it looks crazy, but uh, it actually gets something. And uh, so in blue here, it's this kind of optionality for this uh, company is uh, here as a function of the uh, brand price, and this is a kind of put in a certain sense, a kind of protection. So, so the 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 um, refinery here is a bit like placing a put on the market, and uh, so the real option value is in blue, and the V minus K, the actual uh, immediate exercise price, is what you see in red. So in this sense, we, we get as a result that it's better to wait for the refinery to, um, to, to be in place. Okay, so this is kind of example and solution that we get. Uh, more uh, examples, uh, 15 years uh, investment, uh, now we are using units here of uh, monetary units, 8% if there's free rate, so the cash flow distribution uh, we estimate from the data that they gave us. This is the mean of the cash flow. This is the upper 90%, 95% tile. This is the 5% percentile. And so the things here are uh, wiggles there, as you know. And uh, the project value distribution is like that. This is already taking the discount to the present value. So you see that the project somehow decreases with time, which makes sense because uh, this has a finite final time. And of course, if you have less years of project, then of course you're getting less flow. And uh, the, what we show here is the uh, immediate value uh, distribution. And uh, so the minimum for the exercise is shown here. And so this would be kind of a, a trigger for you to invest uh, if you are hitting that value. And uh, so this is the distribution of project values. So as I said, the lower line corresponds to the 5% quantile, and the top one to the 95%. And so 90% of the case you'd be in here, and so you can compute everything. Uh, I have another example, which I think I'm going to skip because I need to know how much time I have, and until when, can I speak until 12.30? <laughs> Half an hour? 20 minutes. 20 minutes, okay. Okay, so, <clears throat> so those examples were based on real data. But we decided, okay, since we don't have uh, control over this real data, let's run lots of examples with these codes that we prepared. Um, and uh, 
with. Those codes, actually, what uh, we can do is we can run some thought examples. One would be some uh, project that would depend on, let's say, the Google stock price and the gas stock price or gas uh, commodity price. And basically, we construct a cash flow, which we arbitrarily chose as uh, some uh, step function. And uh, we now produce a huge number of simulations just to see how it goes. And actually, we see that the, the results are not so bad. Uh, this is, for example, the time series that we use it for the gas. With, uh, and this is the Google uh, asset price. And uh, we basically played an option between uh, these two assets. And uh, so the log returns. We do the kind of uh, asset simulations. Uh, and we get the cash flow simulations of these fictitious oracle now because our step functions now is working as our oracle. And description of the statistics uh, under the different scenarios. And uh, description of the intrinsic value statistics. So what I show here is the mean of the intrinsic value. You see it's kind of stable. Uh, the minimum value for exercise is given by this yellow curve and uh, the optionality is shown here. So in this case, you actually don't exercise on the average, but of course, if you're in a situation where you are over here, you would, should have exercised. So partial conclusions up to now. This is kind of the first part of my talk and first so we implemented a methodology, we proposed a methodology that would somehow incorporate these managerial views through the oracle. It allows to bypass the problem of using risk-neutral simulations. We are not using anything in risk-neutral measure. We are doing everything in the historical measure. Uh, and uh, on the limit, actually, you can do everything historical if there is no hedging and you're ba back to some kind of optimization problem. Um, and you can take also into account competition games. In fact, this is the hope that uh, in our project here, we can play a little bit with that. This is one of my expectations. Uh, we implemented also deferment options, expansion options, so we, it actually works. Uh, the methodology is somehow model-free in the sense that it really does not depend on which models you put below. Of course, you have to assume some Markovian behind your process, and, but in principle, uh, you can do it uh, even for more general risk measures. And in fact, we have uh, implemented that sure. not, not in this paper that I'm listing here. But. OK. Uh, so now further development. So after that, okay, uh, in the PhD thesis of my former student, Philippe Macias, as I said, we used lots of risk measures instead of variance. We checked that these things actually give good results. Uh, there are lots of theoretical aspects that we have not uh, touched and should be very, very nice for you know, projects in particular for uh, proving conversion, things like that. So there are lots of uh, topics there to be uh, studied that we did not touch. Uh, and the issue of calibration and scenario generations is also very important. Um, the search for optimal basis is uh, pretty much open in the high dimensional case, as far as I know. Uh, now, one issue that actually led to a very interesting discussion with Emmanuel Gobet and then our first uh, work together is how to handle the scarcity of data. So you may remember that I said we have usually very few um, simulations. So how to handle this problem of small number of simulations in such high dimension? Uh, so uh, what we did is we developed what we call the non-intrusive Monte Carlo methods. And what is that? Basically, we take um, the samples from the market and we make some assumptions on the model, which are assumptions, as a good assumption. And based on those assumptions, we do a resampling with a stratified 
um, technology that was already developed by Bobé and Turkgf. And uh, so it gives, it gives us actually very nice results. And so this is what I'm going to describe now. Is there a question? Or you, uh, uh, I'll try. Yeah, my question is, when you go to the office, I don't know what that How do you compute uh, this? Okay, good, very good question. I'm going to repeat because it's a very important question. So his question is basically the following. Suppose instead of the variance, I'm using other risk measures. Well, it depends on the risk measure. Uh, if you get something with tremendous computational complexity, you are stuck. But suppose, for example, you have average value at risk or value at risk or one-sided variance and things like that. Then, in such cases, you can actually simply use the minimization. It's basically a quadratic programming problem. And uh, provided you are within the quadratic programming framework, then everything that we, I said for the risk measure actually works. Uh, if you give me some uh, outer space um, risk measure, then probably I, I cannot do anything, but uh, uh, with, with the, within the quadratic framework and within the, the reasonable risk measures that people work, Actually, there are tricks. It's not totally obvious that you can implement. If you actually do it numerically, you see that there are issues there, and you have to um, make sure that you do some kind of regularization and so on and so forth. So it's not something that you just put in the solve and that go, it goes through. But, uh, but yes, so, so your question is very good. Any other questions? OK. So. Uh, General dynamic programming. So this is now I'm describing the work with uh, Emmanuel and uh, Gang Liu. So uh, we are in a very general framework where we have some general dynamic programming problem. problem. Uh, we are again going backwards and we are taking expected values of some function g. Uh, the yi is this expected value. I change the notation a little bit. My x is still my uh, asset prices. And we want to estimate this function yx. And x is a Markov process uh, that has some properties. And uh, we are not, I'm not going to give details. Please refer to the paper. However, this is related to nonlinear PDEs, as we all know, through the work of uh, Pardu and uh, many other people. Uh, it's also related to optimal stopping problems, BSDEs. And uh, so this is. Uh, a very general problem that has uh, important applications. And we are interested in situations, on situations, where some of the parameters of the model are not completely known. So we have, though, the observation of the trajectories, but we don't know completely the parameters. And uh, in principle, of course, what you can do is take your statistical toolbox, do some kind of uh, parameter estimation and run millions and trillions of simulations and uh, do the usual Monte Carlo things. But uh, we are trying to not, we are trying to bypass this uh, estimation part, okay? Uh, this, of course, is connected to applications in inverse problems, finance, biomath, and so on, okay? So examples, optimal stopping, uh, so we were trying to find the essential soup of some uh, stopping time. Um, and uh, you have the expected value. You do the usual thing. Uh, it's connected to the B BSD that I just put here on the board. I'm not going to go into detail on that. Uh, it's connected also to uh, this PDE, assuming that your underlying process is uh, uh, Brownian motion. If not, of course, you have to do here uh, the standard variance uh, sigma t sigma stuff. Uh, okay, so uh, you reduce this problem to taking expectations again. So again, we have this, this setup. Um, so the usual approach, the usual approach is you produce lots of uh, simulations of the variable x. You come backwards and uh, you compute this expected value. 
you, as I said, use a large number of simulations or resimulations of the process Xi. You then compute this estimator and uh, you do this regression on some statistical dictionary. Um, now, as I said, our problem is what if the models for X are not totally known and we have a small set of historical data. And the answer, uh, the, the answer in the sense of uh, partial answer, of course, because general answer is impossible, uh, is path reconstruction, so resampling and stratification. Now, uh, just a quick description of uh, the stratified resampling. Uh, Blam and Jeff uh, gave a very nice talk a few weeks ago about this, so I think it's recorded, so I refer you to that talk. But uh, basically, you divide your space into strata, and uh, you introduce a probability measure so that you take uh, samples on these different things. Uh, he then describes why the Laplace, Pareto, and certain distributions are very useful for that and uh, you use that as a measuring error. So now you work on these different strata, and that cuts down severely the, the problem, uh, the, the complexity of the problem. And uh, now we use the observations of, uh, that we had, and now we make our assumptions, which is actually specific here. We can somehow extract from the data the noise and we can do such noise extraction uh, by means of certain functions that we know, and I'll give you in a few seconds examples on that. And then we resample to simulate these trajectories using such uh, extracted data. Uh, note that to apply this technology, you need less information than the full detail of the underlying model. We are just using uh, a mix of information about the model and the data that you have, okay? Examples, so let me give you a concrete example to fix the ideas. And of course, you start with the most simple example. Suppose you have uh, some kind of usual Gaussian process, x0 plus integral from zero to t of mu s, ds plus integral from 0 to t of sigma s dws. We uh, then consider these uh, increments from, let's say, I'm, I'm using a little bit of uh, abuse of notation here, so from time i to time i plus 1, you look at that, and basically the function theta that I was talking about to reproduce from the noise your path is just uh, this function here. So from that function, I can actually generate my path. I can actually, if I had lots of u's, uh, regenerate that. Now, if I know that my u is coming from Brownian motion, I have lots of symmetries, and I can resample my path space from the, from the data. So we can actually resample it in different parts of the space using this strata, and that's a way of doing it. Well, if you know how to handle arithmetic Brownian motion, you should know how to handle geometric Brownian motion, and that's what we show here. Same story, instead of working with the differences, xi plus one minus xi, we take log differences, and to a certain extent, we also can handle Austin and Beck. Uh, in the case of matrix or Lambeck, we actually have to know the matrix A. But that's all we need to know, and that's all we need to do this resampling. So the basic idea, I, I like this pictorial uh, description, especially because I, it was very hard to draw it with uh, my software. My software in the sense, the, my available software. So suppose you have uh, some actual observed samples. So here is, for example, some process, another process here that you observe it. So this is real data. What we are doing now is using the data through the function theta that we assume we have within our model 
to resample other parts of the space. And with that, we get more information about the full space, and therefore we get a, a stable result. By the way, these are all uh, proved results, the, the, the estimates, the true estimates with the assumption and so on. I'm just giving you the idea. Uh, in the process, of course, you use ordinary least squares, but you can use other methodologies in principle. Um, so we basically project on a basis given by certain dictionary. We have our samples, we have our function, and we apply the ordinary mean square, least squares. Uh, and uh, so uh, basically, uh, this is the resampling method. We go backwards. We suppose, as I said, that we have an estimation from yi plus 1 to yi in each strata. We sample these according to our law nu k. k here is the index of the strata. We construct the sample paths. We do the ordinary least square. We may have to do some thresholding for stability and for technical reasons and we get a good estimate for a problem. So um, the final algorithm is then take the sample IID starting points, we reconstruct the learning paths, we compute the ordinary least squares, we do the thresholding, and uh, we get an estimation of our value yi, which in turn is the solution of your um, dynamic programming problem. The cost is n square mk. Um, this is not, we cannot bypass that. But our issue here is not really cost. Our issue is that we, are, we get very good estimates, and I'll show you at the end, of, my, of our error. And we can control the error in a very good way. Uh, this can also be parallelized. And just to give you uh, a flavor, uh, this is a numeric example from an equation that doesn't come from math finance. It comes from, well, you can put it in math finance if you wish, but it comes from math biology. This is the FKPP equation, Fischer, Komogorov, Pitaevsky, and Petrovsky, I think equation. Um, and um, so in this equation we have, I'm doing it backwards, so you have the nonlinear term, and uh, this is of course related to branching processes and all that. Uh, and um, turns out that this equation has explicit, well-known solutions, which we can use to check the validity of our computations. And uh, we actually uh, can solve it by this method. So here on the left, what I'm showing to you is a total of 400 um, simulations in R2 that were used as root paths. From there, we use the different uh, strata, and uh, we managed to get the solution on the left uh, as compared to the actual solution on the right that's showing there. And uh, just to answer the issue about uh, error. So the quadratic error on each y, i, is part of an approximation error plus a statistical error plus independence error. And all these errors here we can bound in very explicit ways. I have more details if you wish. So we basically design this non-intrusive resample method. Uh, it combines, we combine these with Monte Carlo schemes and we can solve certain interesting equations. And uh, we illustrate this on several examples. So here is the list of collaborators. Uh, Brigatti, Max Oliveira de Souza, Felipe Macias, Emmanuel Arno, Gani Liu, I'm sure most of you know. And uh, I thank you very much for your attention. Okay, thank you, Rolf, for your nice talk. So, are there any more questions? Okay, thank you. Ah, yeah. Jean-François. Ah, okay. so, Jean yeah, of course.
Thank you. So could you go, go back to your CITAS, the CITAS that, so you gave some example. Uh -huh. uh, yes, yes. Do, do you have, is it, I should read yeah. the paper though, but is it only limited to that or was just an uh, example? Do you uh, have general assumption on the CITAS? Or? Uh, there are assumptions on fit, uh, but uh, things like Lipschitz continuity and uh, I mean technical assumptions that uh, the, the, the assumption we have on theta is that we know theta ij, okay? Uh, so, but notes that by knowing theta ij in this case is knowing this rule that takes x adds with the increments. That's, that's all we, we need to know. I'm not assuming I happen to know the mu. I'm not assuming I happen to know the sigma, okay? Because all I need are the increments here, okay? Then, here again, now in this case, and actually your question is very good, because in this case, unfortunately, we already need to know the A. Without the A, we cannot do much. And of course, if you get more complicated models, you might need to know more parameters. But, you know, at least uh, we reduced our, uh, so what we, do, we don't need to know, for example, we don't need to know the correlation matrix which already is, is a good help. But of course, the mean refreshing rate, if, unfortunately, in this case, we need to know, yeah. And if you go to more complicated models, we, we, we can actually add jumps here too, so this is uh, another possibility. So, so there are things that we can do, there are things that we cannot do, but your question is very well taken. It's actually a question that uh, many people ask when we show the method, and uh, yeah, there's limitations. Thank you. Uh, are there more questions? Okay, let us thank again our speaker. Thank you.